<laughs> Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? <laughs> There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> no crying. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today, we're all about preparation. That's right. Today, we're talking risk management. It all begins with our headline where we'll cover all the don'ts things people don't do when a loved one begins to age. In our TikTok Minute, we'll share a big homeowner's insurance risk. And for our main event, Joe and OG will present their top five most overlooked risks. And don't worry, because I'll share some odd trivia. And now two guys who you can bet on to bring you the best personal finance podcast every time. It's Joe and OG. Well, thank you very much for that, Doug. And we got to include you in that one. That uh, Doug brings us the best announcing every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. How about that? Darn right I do. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> oh, well, that's the way to take a compliment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you better believe it. Damn. You are the most adequate guy we could find. <laughs> okay is denouncer. Welcome to Humble the Podcast. I am Joe Salci. I ever Joe Money on Twitter. And the guy who uh, just slurped down three eggs in like four minutes. Mr. OG. I am getting really good at cooking eggs over easy. I it's love taking me 45 love years. Over easy. My favorite, uh, sunny side up, actually. My yeah, you're a sunny side up guy. You're not an over Do you easy. do those because they're faster? Uh, you have to cook them as long? No, I just, you know, I saw a video and I was like, I like runny eggs and I feel like I could pull this off and I did it and I was like, oh, I'm pretty good. But I it just kind of whittle it down until you kind of get the right cooking time. What's odd about eating eggs with Joe is he does like sunny side up eggs, but he only eats the yolks. Right. With toast. With what? toast. He doesn't eat the healthy part. He just eats the bad I part. I had a manager at Waffle House after Nick, my son, and I ate at the Waffle House like four weeks in a row, came and he goes, is there something wrong with our eggs? I'm like, why? He's like, because you don't eat the whole thing. I'm like, no, that's just what I do. It must take you forever to eat scrambled eggs then. You know, I don't love it. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling that stuff apart. It's just, I'm like, oh, please let me get this joke in. Please don't let me, because it's awesome. <laughs> risk management today, guys. Risk management. You know, uh, the riskiest thing of all is uh, not including the sponsors in our show. So let's do this. And because we're contractually obligated, how about one of these? <laughs> Way to pump it up. Yes. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> say. Well, that sponsor really feels special now, don't they? <laughs> might, might not have been the one-two punch they were looking for, but you know what? We have great sponsors, and we're super thankful for them for helping us continue to Please podcast. Yes, I try to reel it back. No, we're the good guys. <laughs> we, we've we got a top five episode. We're talking risk management today, so let's get started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Kiplinger. Eight don'ts to keep in mind as you and your loved ones age. Uh, this is written don't. <laughs> by a gentleman named uh, Dennis Beaver, an attorney and a, an elder law attorney. Dennis writes, getting older isn't for sissies. Wow. And the more prepared you are for cognitive decline and the issues that come with it, the better your life will be. We're dealing with this OG in our family with, with relatives. And um, you know what? Preparation here is everything. So I wanted to walk through these things that people don't do because I think it's so important to think ahead on these. Number one, don't plan ahead assuming there will be plenty of time when a crisis hits, right? We're all like, oh, I'll think about a catastrophic illness to a loved one, maybe for myself even, uh, later, because this is always going to happen later in our life. We need to maybe speed up that planning. It's silly to just assume that you'll have all the time in the world to sit down and go, let's thoughtfully consider yeah, all it, these it, options uh, while grandpa's in the hospital. It is so um, difficult. We had a We had a loved one going into a nursing home for uh, rehab. And luckily, OG, he already knew, he'd already studied the different nursing homes. He knew exactly where he wanted to go. And when they gave him this laundry list, this huge laundry list, and, and Cheryl and I are halfway across the country from him as his medical power and his 
power of attorney, not optimal, by the way. I mean, don't get me wrong. Cheryl would have flown there immediately if, if he hadn't done the homework. But partly because she's so far away, they looked at this like, what if something happens? And he was able to tell the people right away, this is where I want to go for my therapy. It was on the list. Boom. Had it all prearranged. Second, people don't talk about our care preferences. Who's going to provide it and where, assuming that time arises, our preference would be totally clear. Again, we, uh, we mentioned that, but you know, you also have some different things. Do you need or want a facility? What type makes the most sense? Is it a, you know, a nursing home, assisted living group home, CCRC, which is a continuing care retirement community. And then how are you going to pay for those different things? A lot of people, oh, geez, you know, want to stay at home, right? This relative of ours really wants to stay at home as much as he possibly can. So he's got to do some pre-work there around how are we going to put that in the budget? Yeah, budget and and who's responsible for what and and what are the deciding factors along the way to make other options available? Like when are you going to decide to have other care scenarios in play, so to speak? Because he's in his late 80s, this particular uh, gentleman, he's he's really done some work on his house ahead of time. Like he's been very mobile, but he's already, OG, made his house ready for if he's not, which I thought was just just huge. And by the way, he's optimistic and he's like, this is never going to happen to me. And I hope it's a waste of money. <laughs> I thought about that. It's a great <laughs> idea. It's super. Number three, a lot of people assume that older caregivers can do it all alone and there's no need to involve anyone else. This is a hard thing. A married couple thinks that the spouse that isn't having cognitive issues currently can just handle it. And how many times, OG, over your career have you seen the spouse that still has it together ends up very sick and very, because they're overworked, they're over, I think it has a lot to do with the extreme pressure for caring for your loved one. Well, I mean, it's stressful, it's financially challenging, and you're trying to learn a new skill set at a time in your life where learning new skill sets is not really what, <laughs> where you are in your life. And it's yeah. all because, well, we don't want to bother the kids. Right. We don't, uh, we don't want to burden the kids. Like the kids are going to have to figure out this mess anyway, you might as well have them help you with it. You know, I've been watching that Netflix uh, documentary. Doug, maybe you could look up the name of this if you don't mind while we're chatting about this, but it's the one about Do something living, useful. It's, <laughs> it's the one about living to be a hundred years old. You guys have seen this uh, on the, it's always on the front screen lately on Netflix about these communities. They call them what blue um, blue zones, these blue zones around the world and people that live longer. And you know, a key part of that OG is a tight family unit where the kids take care of the parents. Yeah, Kids taking care of the parents is, is longevity. In fact, the guy who did the, all this work, Dan, starts with a B. Doug's going to get it for yeah, us. No, well, it's the documentary is called uh, Live to 100, The Secrets of the Blue Zones. Yes. And the guy's name is Dan. Oh, Dan Butner. Dan Butner. Yes. Dan Butner says, oh, gee, the second you go into nursing home, it takes... I believe like two full years off your life, if I remember the the stack correctly. But regardless, it takes time off of your life when when you take grandpa and just, you know, push him into the nursing home. Number five, people don't name a trusted person for your financial institution to contact in case of suspicious transactions on your account. Doug, you had this in your family. I had it with another family member where yeah. there was actually OG, a member of our family that was stealing from another family member. Oh, that's and when a we, yeah, stealing from the old family member, just got a hold of their checking account, forged their name, yeah. and had money once a month going from one account to another, <laughs> going from- Not giving themselves a little uh, a little paycheck. A little hay. Yeah, they don't need it. It's their side hustle. My side hustle is stealing from Aunt Well, Edna. at least they did it on the down low and there was no trail on it. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> yes. It was weird that we could look up whose account it was like what account number that was, Doug, and find out exactly where that money was going. Unbelievable. And then, by the way, when we confront them, you know what happened? Oh, it was just a big mistake on the bank's part. I Oh, God, I never even knew. Really? This has been coming into my account for 11 years? Always on yeah. the fifth of every month? Weird. Well, luckily, we caught it in month number four. But still, it was my bad. And by the way, where's that money? Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't, don't, don't have it. Just completely off. So frustrating. Number six, people don't designate a power of attorney for health care or finance until there's a medical emergency or a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's. I know in the case of dementia or Alzheimer's, oh, gee, you wait that long, you may have to get the court involved. Yeah. Well, that's the biggest thing. And frankly, from a power of attorney standpoint, there's so many great uses of having a trusted person as a power of attorney 
already in your life, even at, frankly, even at 40, because it just allows transactions to happen a little smoother. You know, you think about your spouse traveling for work on the same time that you're supposed to be closing on your house. Great idea to have a power of attorney so you can take care of it. And get that done early. Mm-hmm. And don't make it, I know a lot of times when I would work with people on this, they were worried about it being the perfect person. Make it a good person. Yeah. And then switch it later. Just get it done. Number seven, we had an argument about this on a Friday episode. Oh, gee, that I, you weren't in on this one, but don't worry about staying in touch with people. Isolation and loneliness are the enemy. They make you more vulnerable in all sorts of ways. Every study, every single study. And I had a bunch of people push back on me saying I was judgy, saying that you need a purpose and you need a community. And no, 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 Joe, this woman that we were talking about in the show, she just wanted to learn a new language every two years. And I said, that's not enough. And man, our audience came back at me saying, hey, don't judge your goals. She can do it. That, that's a fine goal, OG. It just isn't enough. Isolation is truly every study you see. Isolation is the enemy as you get older. You know, what's funny about that. You see those in your social feed. It'll be a picture of this beautiful cabin out in the woods. And the question will be like, you know, how much would it take? for you to go live here forever. And people are like, nothing. I want to do it right now. We all seem to want isolation, but we don't realize that it could actually be detrimental to the long term. It's funny how social media has made us uh, less together. I saw a statistic just yesterday that 10 years ago, the average person had three close people they could call close friends. We're down to like 2.2. Apparently we have those two close friends and the person that's not quite with it, the 0.2 friend, but the average person with just over two, the number of, the amount of isolation we have with all these social channels is just getting worse. Right now, I count I count you two as like 1.3. <laughs> I'm the one OG gets to be the point three. I'm just saying, OG. I just want to make sure I'm the one. Number eight, and the last one on this is assume all doctors are the same and you don't need a geriatric specialist. Certainly, you should look into who's providing your care. Yeah, agreed. We will link to this in our newsletter called the 201, stackybedjamins.com slash 201. Always free, comes out the day after our Monday, Wednesday shows. And man, it is a very high open rate where we dive deeper into this important topic. Speaking of important topics, coming up in just a couple minutes is our big topic, our top five risks that people don't think enough about when it comes to your protection planning, we need to make sure that we don't have that Achilles heel. Oh, hadn't considered that. OG and I are going to talk about those risks, but we've got two segments before that. First of all, time right now for our TikTok minute. This is the part of the show, Doug, where we look at some creators doing something either brilliant or like some TikToks, air quotes, brilliant. Which one do you think this is? I I go to TikTok for all of my valuable researched information. So of course it's brilliant. Well, this is... This is a woman who lives on a golf course and, uh, well, this is her, I believe, if I remember correctly, this is her speaking with the news. So we got one over there, one, two, three, four. Her house backs up to hole four at Black Bear Golf Club in Parker, the tee box just a couple hundred yards away. I can be sitting here having a cup of coffee, eating. Golf balls will just go sailing past my head. This was the latest casualty, a broken window on the second floor of her home. It's not just the cost of broken windows. It's becoming a life-threatening issue that needs to be addressed. Stevens wants the golf course to do something. She wants the golf course. Let me just say... I'm very certain she had no idea that with a golf course right behind her freaking house, OG, that this would be a problem at all. It's just ridiculous that they decided to start playing golf on the thing that probably was there long before she bought her house. (laughs) That's just, I think she's just mad because everybody started sucking more (laughs) at golf. talk about risk management. Maybe look at where you buy your house. I've only heard of one case where this wasn't ridiculous. Apparently on a dog leg left, this builder sold a lot that was straight on. Absolutely in harm's way. And they should have never been able to put a house there. And it was right out at the corner where everybody, big hitters like OG, they're going to try to bomb that, right? They're going to try to hit right over that house. And uh, I think they got some recompense they got some money back from the builder because that like you should never put a house out on the corner of but come a on why you buy that house in the first place though you know what i mean i mean do some due diligence agreed agreed but other than that it's and there are actually most state laws where uh the golfer is never you know required to pay any money back to any damage they cause because unless no, that's good 
I mean, now that I know yeah, that. So now you just rotate your stance and just aim right for the house because that glass <laughs> makes a great noise. <laughs> Have you ever hit a house, Doug? We're joking, people. Have I ever hit a house? <laughs> Which time? Yes, of course I've hit a house. It, well, you know, I mean, you're a pretty good golfer, so it does scare the bejeebus out of you. It is pretty funny, though, because you're like, ah, oh, my bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. Playing through. Mind if I get that ball real quick? I've never hit a window, which is, I mean, you feel like, look, if I'm going to hit it, I might as well, like, let's do this right. Let's get the satisfying noise. I've never hit a window. I always hit a roof. If I'm her, I think the best strategy is to dress that up and uh, maybe, maybe massage how she talks about that on the disclosure form (laughs) a little bit for the next idiot to be on TV complaining about it as well. Poor risk manager. All right. Coming, (laughs) coming up next, our top five risks people don't think about this one the golf club living on the golf club might have been a little more obvious than the ones we're looking at but before we get there doug i think you've got some trivia for us absolutely hey there stackers i'm joe's mom's neighbor doug over the weekend i got a brilliant idea for a new side hustle i set up a poker table in my basement i'm gonna start inviting the guys over to play for money i'm in yeah and because i'm maybe not the world's best card player I'm going to charge everybody like a small buy-in fee just so I make sure I make money no matter what. I'm out. I mean, I can't wait to get this going. I've already ordered a couple of vending machines and an ATM to bring in extra cash on top of the poker fees. But I'm going to start with the basics, a Mortal Kombat arcade game and an Aerosmith pinball machine. Because, I mean, you can't have a poker table without that, right? But once the word spreads about this cool semi-private casino idea, I'm going to be able to expand it and make even more money. I'll be able to franchise it, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be like an Airbnb thing, but for gambling in your basement. Probably going to call it Doug's Double Down Den, because, like, why wouldn't you? But let's get to today's trivia question. Related. It's related. Don't worry. When can you buy insurance at a blackjack table? Asking for a friend. I'll be right back after I post flyers around the neighborhood. Hey there, stackers. I'm entrepreneur and pinball pro, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I've started building out Doug's Double Down Den, and I'm so excited for the guys to see it. It just needs a few neon beer signs, and I'm going to open up shop. Today's trivia question is, when can you buy insurance at a blackjack table? The answer, while experts advise against it, you can buy insurance on your blackjack game once the dealer has an ace showing. And now, let's get back to Joe and OG and more risk management talk. OG, like how Doug takes our uh, risk management, turns it into insurance and gambling trivia. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you're on a heater, you got to. <laughs> you got to. Uh, what I'm hoping for more than anything is a list uh, here of things that people might think about, might not think about. Maybe they think about sometimes don't consider enough other things that are like, Oh, I should maybe consider that. So if you're listening to this, I really like the fact that when we do these top fives that maybe OG and I take the instructions a little differently. I have eight, (laughs) eight on your top five. (laughs) I will merge. some, But I like that because we get a little different direction and and OG, I looked at it as these Achilles heels that we really need to consider more often. Like the things that come at us that we're like, Oh, wow. Wow. Should have seen that coming. What about you? Is this going to be a little quirky for you? Uh, I didn't understand the assignment also, so um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what we come up with. All right. Well, let's do this. Our top five risks that we uh, maybe don't pay attention to enough. Number five. You want to go first this time? I think I went first last time. Yeah. Uh, no, that's fine. I'll go first. I'm going to do an easy one. This is in no particular order, even though it's a top five. It's not like literally five, four, three, two, one for me. I just have these in... Just kind of a a random order here. Um, I think that most people are concerned, you know, when thinking about financial planning, they think about the risk of dying and thinking about like, well, I got a mortgage to pay, I got kids to send to college, that sort of thing. I don't think too many people think about living too long. And that also is an interesting risk because when you have that time frame that's on that one side, it's like we talk about how you can retire better you know, more money if you retire at 65 instead of 60, right? But what if you, what if you offset that by planning on dying at 90 and you lived to 103? Yeah, you know, so uh, living too long 
is the risk I think a lot of people forget about. Boy, that's a great one. And that did not make my list, but I know this is a big challenge that CFPs are addressing right now, right? With longevity annuities and with these asset allocation plans. I think that's part of the reason why you and I dislike target date funds so much, OG, is because of that longevity risk. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and what we mean by that- Also every- bond suck. <laughs> what we mean by that is that you're slowing down your chance of doubling the money in your portfolio well before you're going to spend the money because the target date fund is made to hit the target, maybe go just a little bit beyond the target, meaning that you're going to slow down the risk, which also means slowing down the chance of a high enough return to sustain you for a long life. My number five, I'm just going to pay homage to, because while we all know these two things are going to happen, OG, I think like we talked about in today's headline, we think they're always going to happen way out in the future. Uh, And that is, I, I don't think that I'm going to die or I'm going to get a disease that that happens to other people, or it's going to happen a long time from now. And the frustration that I have with this is that I have a great friend who's a nurse practitioner. She's run with our group of runners for a long time, super healthy, just got a brain tumor. Oh, gee, like out of the blue, way too busy to have a brain tumor, too much stuff going on. And it looks like things are okay. Everybody here in Texarkana that knows her is pulling for her. She's just an amazing woman, but you know, 47, 48 years old, out of the blue. Something that happens to other people happens way later. And I think we got to be more cognizant that that could happen to me. And what am I going to do? I mean, nurse practitioner, she makes a nice sum of money that supports her family. Mm -hmm. This tumor may have lasting effects that may mean that she needs long-term disability coverage, or she at least needs a plan, right? That's longer than two or three months. We'll see how it goes, but, uh, but that's my number five. Number four. My number four is that uh, the people around me are going to be respectful of my property, <laughs> meaning that I take care of my stuff, right? And this could even involve stealing, but between stealing and I've had my house broken into, had all my stuff stolen, that is something I had never thought would happen to me. But also just the fact that somebody uses something of mine, comes over to my house, uses something of mine. And just break. I often think that I'm careful with my things, but I don't think we think enough about the people around me and the fact that, you know, mistakes happen and some people aren't that careful. Note to self, keep hands in my pocket at Joe's house. (laughs) (laughs) Unless the Troika dolls. Thinly veiled. (laughs) Smashing across the concrete. And what does that mean for our protection play? Number one, it means the emergency fund, right? But number two is, I think all we look at OG on our homeowners, I think all we look at is the cost. We don't look at like what happens if, you know, somebody accidentally drives my running lawnmower into the lake. Hasn't happened. But what if that happens? Like that could be a significant amount of money. Or your car through your living room. Could happen. Has happened. Theoretically. Uh, Yeah. So my number four, I'm going to go with, you mentioned house, house stuff. And this happened to us here recently while I was on a trip happened more frequently actually than I desire. I'm going to say emergency house maintenance. Things that people don't think about in terms of, you know, stuff that you're not going to nest. You were talking about maybe home insurance claims and that sort of thing. Maybe not. But I'm also thinking about you're not going to home insurance claim your water heater going out. But when is your water heater going to go out? I'll tell you when. Christmas Eve. Exactly. <laughs> right before everyone shows up at your house. Exactly. Or that, that happened. does everyone know how to shut the water off in their house? I don't think everybody does. Like, you know, so if something's leaking and spraying water out of your kitchen, you know, spraying everywhere. How do you get that stopped immediately? So then, you know, there's not that secondary damage. You know, we live in Dallas. We've had two years of record breaking cold temperatures for extended periods of time, which has caused all sorts of other issues in, in people's homes. You know, so how to shut off the water, how to, do you have a system in place for like checking on your things? What happens if your dishwasher breaks or your refrigerator? You know, it's like these things that we don't really anticipate and certainly don't plan for and put into our budget. I've found that a rule of thumb is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% of your house value is what you're going to write a check for every year just for the crap that goes on around your house. Some of it may be upgrades. Some of it may be things that I need to fix. Some of it may be things that are kind of deferred maintenance. I'm thinking about your grill, just the thing that happened to your grill. Which time? (laughs) Right. When it melted, the wires, (laughs) you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it was just on and melted. Yeah. 
Well, that was a who happened to my grill more than a what happened to Maybe my grill. Maybe that goes back but... to mine, right? Yeah. <laughs> how do you guys feel about, in this vein, how do you feel about, uh, what is it, like a home warranty that you can buy yeah. for all of this smaller stuff versus just socking away money for, to prepare for the inevitable uh, relatives that break your grill? Yeah. We haven't had any reasonable success with that. You know, it kind of comes included with a lot of home purchases. It's a selling feature that realtors use. Uh, and mortgage companies use to get your business. But um, I don't particularly think that it's worked out well for us because we had it for a period of time. And I remember we had a microwave issue and they're like, well, they don't make that part anymore. And we said, okay, so now what happens? And they said, well, we're going to give you the cash value, which uh, this microwave is, you know, eight years old. So here's $87. Yeah, right. It's mm. like, okay. You yeah. know, I just kind of, it's slimy. It's not replacement value insurance. I've actually had a better experience Oh, gee. And once again, I didn't buy the insurance, Doug. Uh, it was attached to the house that I bought. Yeah. But, we, but we had two claims, one on a washing machine, one on a refrigerator, and we did get new ones. But I think that's replacement value coverage versus, you know, today's value coverage. Cash and value. Replacement yeah. value is going to be more expensive and the person selling the house is not going to want to buy. <laughs> it's not going to want to buy the replacement value coverage. Yeah. But to answer Doug's question, I think it's more important for that insurance if you don't have an emergency fund which is why you build the emergency fund as fast as you can. The cool thing about the emergency fund, you can begin jettisoning, jettisoning insurance, easy for me to say, when you get that emergency fund in place. Number three. Uh, I'm going to take number three here right out the gate. And uh, I got so many on here. I'm trying to piece them together. Um, I'll save one here. Um, I'm going to say um, parental assistance. Or just brought more broader based family assistance. If you have any sort of family relationships in your life, parents or siblings, and you're doing okay financially, there will come a time when someone will say, oh, we're a little tight. We're a little tight, like Cousin Eddie sitting on the couch asking Frank for oh, $23,000. <laughs> you know, sure, Eddie, how much do you need? And he pulls out a couple of 50s and he's like, $23,000. And, and having a plan for either A, being able to fulfill those needs, or B, knowing how to handle that in terms of the conversation, how you want to discuss that, how the protocol is for you and the other people that are making your money decisions, maybe your spouse or whatever, to be able to have a process for discussing that rather than that awkwardness of going like, oh, uh, you know, you just don't know, right? You're I was reading a reading a Reddit thread the other day about this couple who had some family members who were not very financially responsible and the husband wanted to take care of mom and the sister and who the mom and sister had lived in this house, uh, rented a home for a long time, but the owner was selling it. And so the new owner came in and said, well, I would love to keep you guys. Rent's going up fourfold, 400%. This guy wasn't charging enough. Years. You know, so they're all freaking out. Da, da, da. So husband wants to help. Wife says, no, we can't do it. Husband does it anyway. Buys mom and sister a house puts it on his name. They get to live there. He's not on the title. He's on the mortgage. Like all these like bad decisions, one right after another. And of course, doesn't tell his spouse oh. until it comes up and it goes, oh, by the way, you know, that house that I bought, you know, I bought for my mom. You know, it's like, oh. like having a process for having that discussion and thinking about it in advance will help. But even just thinking about the potentiality, one of the questions we ask from a planning standpoint with, with our, you know, kind of Gen X clients is what's going on with mom and dad? Are you going to be asked to contribute to their financial needs at some point in time in your life? And if you're the successful one in your family, the answer is yes, you will. Unless they also are, you know, beyond successful too. But back to our nobody's planning on living very long. It just kind of runs out, you know? So anyway, family assistance, the conversations, the planning for all of that, like trying to, trying to have a thought process around that I think most people skip. And then they get bombarded at the family grill and they're reaching in their pocket for $50 bills and cousin Eddie's asking. For I saw money. people handle this uh, two different ways. Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank. I saw him talk about this. People ask him for money, relatives ask him for money. He says, I'm going to give you more than what you asked for. Of course, he has means so he can afford to do that. I'm going to give you more. This is going to be a gift. And you and I are going to have a contract that says... You are never, ever going to talk to me about money again, period. We are not going to have this ruin Thanksgiving. We're not going to have this ruin the holidays. This is it. 
one time and you're done. So what was his number again? Do you remember? I was, I, know, I, haven't, I haven't used my shit up yet with uh, Mr. Wonderful. I would like to ask him for $100 million. Hey, this is cousin OG. I'm going to give you a little more than he has for. I don't want you to invest in my business. I, I just want, you know, I promise not to talk. About um, it. And there's another way I heard of, which I think I like even better, which is uh, this man of means has plenty of money. His family doesn't know, and he doesn't want them to ask. So every year he asks them for money. <laughs> So that they're sure he's broke and nobody's ever going to ask him for money. So he does it systematically to make sure the question never comes up. Nobody's coming near my money. I'm not having those awkward conversations. I'm okay with everybody thinking that I got nothing. (laughs) I'm not having the awkward conversation, but I'm going to create one. That's right. (laughs) It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. It it reminds me of uh, the art of war. You know, the best, the best battle is the one you don't fight. So just get rid of it ahead of time. Uh, My number three is. As we record this, there's, uh, you know, natural disasters going on in the U.S. and around the world. A natural disaster is not going to hit me, right? Or even less because people go, okay, yeah, tornadoes, maybe, but probably not. Lightning strike, probably not. But, oh, gee, I've had animals in my house Rawr. that have surprised hell out I of me. I left when you asked me to. <laughs> I was going to say, and I'm not talking about my friends like Doug, right? We had this weird noise in our uh, ventilation system. And I looked down in the, in the register and there's an animal looking right up at me and boy, those repairs finding out where it was. And then that repair ended up costing me a ton of money. And of course I also figured out why my heating bills were so high (laughs) because there was a way for them to get in. We also had squirrels in our attic which people said that about Doug before too. He's got squirrels Ah, in his attic. Oh, you're killing me. That's something else. That's a euphemism. Yeah. So natural disasters, animals won't interfere with my stuff. What are you going to do if that happens? That's my number three. Number two. Number two, I think, is the big one. I, man, OG, when we would talk about disability coverages and people would tell me I'm a safe skier, or they'd tell me I'm a really good driver. And so we don't need to talk about disability and the fact that that might happen. My number two is I won't do something clumsy. And, and when you do the clumsy thing, it is the wildest thing. I was on a, I was on a 15 mile run with friends of mine. I went around a corner. I'm talking to somebody next to me. So I'm not paying attention. I ran into a concrete flower box and I ran into it so hard that there was a police station next door. A cop took me five miles back to my house. Cause I could barely walk and I had trouble the next like two days, but uh, you know, you can make that Joby and Joe, but stuff just happens. There's a, you fall down. My mom fell down the stairs when she was in her early thirties and broke her back. One of our planners was doing a TikTok video and she won't mind me telling this because it's viral on TikTok. <laughs> was doing a TikTok dance and did it on a curb and kind of offset on the curb a little bit and broke her foot. <laughs> oh, just, ouch. just by doing the TikTok yeah. dance. So that's don't do that, Jacqueline. Yeah, be ready. Be ready for the clumsy. Let's have a real disability discussion. All right. My number two is natural disaster. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I went a different direction with this. I literally wrote EMP nuclear war Jeez. off the grid. Yeah. Welcome to the former Marine here, by the way. I guess Marine's always a Marine, well, but still. And here's what I mean by that. It, you were talking about natural disaster in terms of like you know tornadoes and you know that lightning hitting your house and that sort of thing. But I'm thinking about it in the context of what do you do if it's like Houston during Hurricane Harvey and there's no power for four weeks. What about the big Texas freeze? Yeah. I mean, that wasn't four weeks, thankfully, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, any of those things that are, you know, when I was a kid, we always had fire safety month and the fire department would come to the school and talk about, make sure you have a plan. And you know, if something happens and we had a fire in our house when I was a kid, so that kind of hit home. And I was thinking about, you know, we don't really do that a lot anymore, or at least maybe my kids do, and I'm not aware of it, but taking that a step further and going, well, what happens if you don't have access to the internet for the next week, month, couple of weeks? What happens if you don't have access to a shower or your clothes or like what is going to what are you going to do so that you can keep living if, you know, you're one of these displaced people for whatever reason, a flood, tornado, wildfire, hurricane, civil event, you know, cuz any of these things have happened in the last couple of years, you can see them. And it's stuff like, you know, making sure that you have some cash at home, right? Making sure that you have an idea of where are we going to go so that I can get my family to safety 
so that then we can kind of decompress and go, okay, now how are we going to fix this problem, right? If your house washes away in a hurricane, you can't be sitting on the boat next to it trying to formulate how I'm going to rebuild it, right? You have to go somewhere and having, having that thought around, you know, where you're going to go or what you're going to do, or at least again, thinking about the scenario in advance enough that it gives you the chance to think reasonably about it as opposed to the boats here, you know, it's time to go. What are we doing? You know, it's just, um, I don't think a lot of people think about those, those risks because eh, it doesn't happen to me. Number one. Well, that means it's that time. OG means it's that time. You ready? Uh, this is kind of feels like a cop out, but I think it's okay. Most people don't think of real time market risks. And I don't necessarily mean market risks in terms of market fluctuation, like the stock market, uh, although that's part of it. But all of the ancillary things that go with market fluctuation and market risk, like, for example, the impact in the last year and a half of rising rates to fixed income portfolios. Like, what is the relationship of that? And how is that, you know, how does that work as it relates to my portfolio? I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal that it's a little Pollyanna. It's, it's you know, like the 60, 40 portfolio is broken. It will never work again. It's like, okay, settle down. Well, it could be that we're at the beginning of a time where it doesn't work great for a while. Like what is, what's your plan if you can't use a hundred years worth of market data for the next 10 or, or what's your plan if we don't get the eighties to 2000 over the next 20 years. And it's more like 65 to 80 over the next 15 years. It doesn't mean that the economy is broken or it doesn't mean that you're not going to reach your goals, but they're going to change, right? And I think a lot of times from a planning standpoint, it's really easy to sit down with a spreadsheet and go, yeah, I'm going to put this money in. I'm going to grow it at 4% or I'm going to grow it at 8% a year. I'm going to live on the 4% rule, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And it's like all those rules of thumb work over a hundred years of data. They may not work over the next 10 and I think it's really important to do some scenario planning, especially around financial independence, around what if we just happen to be unlucky? What happens if you're the guy that retires January 1 of 2008 with the proverbial 100% stock portfolio, right? Like you should be, I, I think. And then you wake up on January 1st of 2009 and you're down 47%. Just unlucky. You thought, ah, I can withstand 10%. I can withstand 20%. You wake up and you're down 50. And by the way, it's not over. You know, thinking about those extraordinary, you know, tail, what's that called? Long tail risks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like those those once in a million black swan. chances, the black swan events that happen every single other week, you know, it seems like. I don't think we spend a lot of time from a planning standpoint dissecting those things. That doesn't mean you should focus on it and be like, well, I'll never retire because, you know, all these scenarios are bad. But having a plan on the shelf and thinking about it in advance gives you the opportunity to be a little more calm. God forbid something off the rails happens. That should have been my number one as well. Yes, because it should have. It, no, oh. it totally should have. Because That's I think so that awesome. when I think through that risk, that creates a cavalcade of other problems. Like the second that that happens, well, what do you have to do? You got to double down and quote make the money back. And then you end up taking some unnecessary risks. And then... Even if your muffler is dragging behind the car later, you don't want to take money out of your portfolio. Like it completely yeah. changes your life. Everything. It changes everything. Doug's Googling cavalcade right now. Right. That is it. And don't get me wrong. It's not that disability doesn't change your life. It certainly does. But man, that's a, that's a good one. My, my last one is another one on the disability train because my number two was I won't do something clumsy. Number one was I talked about, you know, earlier, further up, homeowners insurance is fine and people being good to my stuff or me being good to my stuff is fine. But other people being careful when they're out and about and doing stuff to me, like we've all seen the video OG of the driver that falls asleep and goes into the other lane. And I'm not the driver that fell asleep. I'm the driver in the other lane or somebody, the truck, right? Where the wheel comes off. And then the truck, I remember driving down I-94 one time and this, this uh, fifth wheel just gets going back and forth and back and forth. And before I know it, quarter mile up the road, we're going down this big long hill on our way towards Chicago. And uh, the thing starts flipping sideways, the truck and the trailer flipping sideways, going down three lanes of traffic. And if you're anywhere near that, you know, that stuff happens fairly regularly. I so had you're a, saying you're not the Schlemiel, you're the Schlemazel. That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Doug makes it succinct. Thank you, Mr. Dre. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Okay. You're on the bad end of somebody else's stuff. And I think even if we are a safe skier, or a good driver, 
we don't consider that it isn't always about us. Oh, gee, that somebody else can make bad stuff happen in our life. Yep. Those are great. Certainly not exhaustive. We'd love to hear yours. And we will do those at a back porch segment, a community segment that we have at the end of every episode. If you send us yours, what did we miss? What do you think needs to be on this list? And uh, how do you think about our top five list? Head to uh, either our basement Facebook group or write me, joe at stackingbenjamins.com, and uh, we'd love to talk about it more on a future episode. And I'm sure we will definitely be talking about these more as we go, because risk management, huge part of planning. And OG, people want to talk about, insurance companies want you to talk about buying insurance. I think well before you buy insurance, we need to think about what my risk is, right? And then how do I approach it? And insurance is just one way of potentially many. Hey, time for us to help a stacker who went, you know what? I should call Saul. C high and OG. Today, I want to dive into our Facebook group. We have some great discussions on our Facebook group. This one, OG, is really interesting. This comes from uh, Stacker Will, and there was a great discussion in our group about this. He said, Is there a list somewhere of recommended fee only as in one time or annual single fee financial advisors? I'd like to share with my mom to get her off of the assets under management advisor. So therefore, any conversation or recommendations about the fact that AOM is a fee is just derailing the conversation for no good. So he doesn't want to talk about AUM is a fee and that uh, and that there's a fee thing. So w- what he's looking for, OG, is somebody to come in and look at the situation one time. Now, before you answer this, I just want to take a stab at this myself because of the fact that the reason I brought this to the table is there have been studies done, Joe, that what we all want is a non-biased, just give me the facts advisor and I will go take care of this myself. Let me tell you what the studies show is that the number one implemented advisor is the advisor we all hate. The commission-based advisor, which by the way, they might be implementing stuff that's 80% likely to be successful, 90%, maybe 100%. So my first question to Will is, before you take your mom and you give her, quote, great advice, are you really getting what you, what you, and I'm not saying it's bad, OG, to get a fee only one time advisor look. That can be fantastic. But let's just make sure that we're doing something with that advice. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, what's really interesting here is that if you price out everybody, whether it's commission, AUM, flat fee, you know, and I'm talking about like the ongoing relationship stuff, it all is the same. <laughs> you know, it's all the same. The folks at Edward Jones who are largely commissioned transitioning to fee recently, you know, out of all of the major, you know, investment firms, you know, they're still kind of the hanging on to, to, to more of a commission basis. If you look at a per advisor basis and, you know, revenue and all that sort of stuff, they make the same money as the guy who just charges the flat fee. Like I don't, you know, what drives me crazy is the holier than thou attitude that different groups have about how they do it right? There is no right answer to it. It's just what works for you and your business and what works for you and your clients. We do a mixture. That's how we do it. It doesn't make our way the best way or the worst way. It's just what works for us and works for the people that we work with. Well, I look at, and, I look at OG to take you as an example or a friend, Roger Whitney, because you and I have talked about this a lot. Roger and I have talked about this a lot. Yeah. You have a way that works well for you. You want to walk with your client for a long period of time. So even the notion of I'm going to look at it one time and just leave, that's for a different advisor because that's not what you want, right? So you're not going to be on that list because it doesn't fit where the type of client that's looking for the thing that you're looking for. Roger is a very specific thing. He's every advisor says, you know what, Um, Dana Ansbach, you know, another great example. I've got this type of client. Well, you don't have to say advisor. You can literally just say, you can literally just say business. You're right. Yeah. Good point. You could just say, this is the business that I'm in. I'm in the business of this. You know, you can't go to the Ford dealership and go, it would be swell if you guys could show me the newest Tesla. The Ford guy's like, we're not in the business of Teslas. We have a great Ford product that we really strongly believe in. But if you want a Tesla, you're in the wrong spot. I got this great screenshot of a message that uh, another advisor friend of mine got, which I thought was great and says, hey, thanks for reaching out. I'm curious, how many trades a month do you make on average? Please provide different examples based on the size of portfolio and what is your average return for the last five years oh for all the portfolios God. you've managed. <laughs> Thank you. So not a fit for this person who sent it to me and said, look at this email I got, but a fit for somebody, right? There is somebody out there for this person. And the same thing is true for 
for Will's folks that he's trying to help and for Will and for Joe and for Doug and for OG. Like, we just need more people giving good financial advice. And at the end of the day, find the thing that works for you. To specifically answer Will's question, I'm with you on all that stuff, Joe, by the way. Like, eh, <laughs> I don't think you're really helping mom, but this is what mom wants and what you want. Off you go. I would look at like uh, Garrett Financial Planning Network or Garrett Planning Network, I think is the name of it. XYPN is a group of advisors that have different kind of alternative fee arrangements. Although XYPN might be a little bit more ongoing based. Garrett's definitely going to be, uh, have, have more options there. Or just generically go on the CFP board website, cfp.net or NAPFA, National Association of uh, Fee Planners. Is that what it is? Anyways, uh, you can Google it. And put in the search criteria that you have and the area that you want to search in, right? I live in Annapolis and I want an advisor within 30 miles, da 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 You can do all that and, uh, and come up with a list and, and interview a few of them. So they exist. They're out there. You just have to, just have to Google it. Garrett's probably my go-to one-time planning place. And you know what? Uh, Kevin Bailey will dive into this more in the 201, our newsletter uh, that comes out every Tuesday and Thursday all different types of advisors and uh, discussions about advisory relationships that work and ones that don't work. Uh, Stackybenjamins.com slash 201 uh, gets you there. It's always free. And um, man, just uh, Kevin has just juicy stuff on all the topics we talk about on the Monday, Wednesday shows. All right. That's going to do it for today. In terms of community calendar, Joe, you know what we got going on in the community calendar? Uh, first of all, I got to tell everybody, follow us on Instagram. We do mostly you, right? But do these great Instagram lives. So make sure you're following us there because uh, there's some really fun uh, discussions and they're short, they're quick hits, but they're, they're a lot of fun, especially because they're live. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is a review we got from Papa Chuckles. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I just wanted to say that out loud because that's the best handle I've seen in a long time. But he gave us this review. He says, great gang of slackers, oh, not boy. stackers, slackers. And he says, you know, those people who always seem to be slacking, having fun at work and not looking like they're actually doing anything productive, yet they always get the job done and better than most. That's this gang, wow. the gang I want to be part of or emulate. Now, this part sucks, actually. Or emulate when I get as old as these dudes. Oh, man. <laughs> that was unnecessary, Papa Chuckles. You know what, though, Doug? On point. I mean, come on. Look at the gray hair across here. <sighs> I mean, on point. Okay. He, he finishes by saying, you won't feel like you're learning anything, yet you'll be better off for it. Highly recommend. Five stars. So, Papa Chuckles, 96% of that review was fantastic. <laughs> And the rest was truthful, but we'll let it go. <laughs> Thanks uh, so much for that. Hey, on to the back porch segment. You know, one thing, we've talked about movies. We talked about TV shows we've been watching. We haven't talked about video games. And while the three of us don't have a lot of time to play video games, I know we all, you know, we dabble. We dabble. Doug, what have you been playing lately that's been uh, good? You like the fighty games. The uh, uh, And by fighty, I don't mean like the Mortal Kombat. I mean, you like the Modern Warfare slash Battlefield slash Rainbow Six. Well, first of all, the games that I really like are co-op, games that I can play co-op. So I'm I'm never going to turn on my Xbox just because I'm bored and I want to play. Oh, that's not true. I will golf occasionally. But otherwise, I'm not going to turn my Xbox on just because I'm going to, you know, do something, race or something like that. But if you're like, hey, Doug, do you want to play Sea of Thieves or do you want to golf? I'm all in because for me, it's the social aspect. So there's a game that I play a lot with you guys or with another friend of mine called Sniper Elite. There's a little bit of fighting, but it's mostly that more strategic kind of sneaking around. You really got to think, kind of solve a puzzle more than just the super fast, you know, what, what do they call it? Um, massive, massive multiplayer yeah. or just multiplayer. Yeah. Yeah, that because I'm going to die in 22 seconds. I I can't stand that. So uh, those are the those are the games I'm going. Yeah, you're taking out the one that I played, the most recent one. You're taking out Nazis. You're sneaking up on them, and you know what? I got to this point though, Doug. They always seem to find me. Like I try to hide in the tall grass, and then they come find me, and then I end up trying to, you know, of course shoot them because they're going to shoot me. And uh, next thing I know, I got like 80 of them around me. Yeah, because you just poke the hornet's nest when you make all that noise. That's what I mean. That I like that. I like sneaking around. Yeah, no, that's fun. And Sea of Thieves, for people who haven't played it, 
just a goofy pirate game. Like, I love that you can load yourself into the cannon and shoot yourself onto the island. Okay, that's just weird. <laughs> it, is, it is super fun. I get that's vertigo. the part you like? Well, I get vertigo when I'm up in tall buildings. Uh, when we were in New Orleans for FinCon, uh, I had a room on the 46th floor, and looking out my window gave me vertigo. And when I load myself, when I'm watching my, my character in Sea of Thieves shoot up in the air, I get vertigo as I'm coming down. Like, it's that... It is. It is crazy. Oh, gee, what uh, what video game you've been playing lately? Uh, none. none. Like, literally, <laughs> I haven't turned on an Xbox or anything in eight months. You and I play golf a little bit. I haven't played golf with you in years. So, no, you must be thinking <laughs> of someone such else. A lie. <laughs> <laughs> such a lie. One of my favorite times with OG playing golf and uh, we play 2K golf, by the way, is the one that we play. You say we. I've uh, literally played it like four times, and I hated it every time I played, so I stopped you playing. You played it with my brother. We were all on the hated sofa. It. Well, yeah, because there's a thing to speed up. So when you, we, when you hit it, Doug, as you know, when you hit the ball and it's flying, it goes really slow, right, the animation? And uh, my brother would hit his ball. OG would hit his ball, and he'd hit this button that would speed it up and make it just land so that you can get on with the game. I would hit the ball and it would speed up and it would land. My brother would hit the ball and would never speed it up. It's the slowdown button. And I think OG mentioned it like the first three times. And then he just sat on the sofa drinking his beer and there's smoke coming out his ears as my brother's in no. another story and the ball's just going and going. I mean, that's certainly one of them, but um, also the game sucked. So <laughs> game, I hated it. The game's great. And, and then you started a league and I played two rounds and i was like well this sucks so any golfing experience that og doesn't excel at he just blames blames the game yeah. blames the course, course. Yeah. yeah absolutely i'm liking the new forza doug i know you you do some driving games i like the new forza that i like driving games i i actually want i'd like to play that with you yeah I'll do no that. the new force is fun for people that are really into indie games uh there's a game that takes about four hours i thought was very charming called a short hike and it's about this bird and you are trying to climb this mountain, but you got to collect different things to climb the mountain. It took me four hours and it was just charm the hell out of me. It was a super, super fun game. Doug, you would hate it, actually. I probably would. Uh, this is not a recommendation for you. My sister loved it, thought it was fantastic. But if you're into that sort of things and you've got an Xbox, uh, check out a short hike. And speaking of that, we're going to take a short hike until uh, Wednesday. How about that, guys? It was okay. That, that was no? just... That was just kind of... Yes. How about before we take a short hike, we end this with this. If you're not here because you want to know the latest video game, you're not even here just for risk management. You're here because across the board, risk management or otherwise, you need to make better financial decisions. OG and his team are taking clients. So here is how you get on their calendar. Ready? Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG, and that will lead you to OG and his team's calendar. And that is the first step to finding out how their team can interface with you so you make better decisions than you've made in the past. Stackingbenjamins.com slash OG. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode. Man, more fun on Wednesday. Uh, remember, you can get the 201, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 for a deeper dive on everything we talked about. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from you and OG. It's called risk management for a reason. You need to mitigate your exposure to risks in advance. Pro tip, start today. Second, home warranties may not cover all those unforeseeable events that always seem to happen right before annoying relatives show up for the holidays. If it's not a replacement value policy, you'll still need an emergency fund to make up the difference. But the big lesson? Make sure to research the gambling laws in your state before you build an in-home casino. Otherwise, you might end up having to find someone who lives nearby you and is in the market for a Mortal Kombat machine. It's not as easy as you think. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. Karen and Joe get help from a few of our neighborhood friends. You'll find out about our awesome team at stackingbenjamins.com, along with the show notes and how you can find us on YouTube and all the usual social media spots. Come say hello. Oh, yeah, and before I go... Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Stacking Benjamins.